Hi guys, welcome back to the channel and welcome to this video. All of the highlights from the 2022 Gaydon Land Rover Show. Welcome, oh, there we are. Yeah, so right, I'm here. That was embarrassing, but never mind. Kyle, take the Series 1 away because we will open the show with the Series 1 in about 10 minutes' time. They're going to be the first things in the arena. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Gaydon Land Rover Show. I'm Tim Watson, your commentator. I'm joined by Dave Barker. So delicate in their design. And that's driven all the way here from Devon. Really? Right, let's have a chat with you, sir. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, I'm fine. How are you? Very well. You've driven this all the way from Devon. Uh, can, can yes, I just all the way from Devon, out? yes. This all is the, the legend that's David Bowie. The legend that is David Bowie. Now, you've come all the way from... Where about in Devon? Mid-Devon. Mid-Devon. So how long did that take you? Well, about uh, five hours plus two and a half hours delay down in Devon with an accident on the uh, M5. But it's about, 100 and, about 175, 180, about 180 miles. 180 miles. Now, for ladies and gentlemen stood around looking at this wonderful vehicle here, what year is it? 1955. 1955. Now, 67 my 60, years old. 60, 67 years old, slightly older than myself, very slightly. Uh, but doing 180 miles, I wouldn't like to do 180 miles when I'm 67. How did the old girl do? Extremely well. In fact, last year for our national rally up at Oldswater, just um, southwest of Penrith, I went all the way up there. From Devon, no problem. I did Fantastic. stop overnight halfway in the same back again, I have to admit. <laughs> I would hope that you'd have a rest because, let's be honest, they're not the fastest of vehicles, oh, well, are this they? One, this one actually is a special vehicle. Talk to me about that. Well, it's got a lot of history to it, actually. Um, it was bought by the Reverend Andrew Stevens, who's one of the founder members of the Land Rover Series 1 Club, back in the mid-70s. He bought it for £100 in a pub car park. And it wasn't in terribly good condition, so he spent a fair bit of time in uh, making it road roadworthy. 
And then as a vicar, he was responsible for seven parishes. So he wanted it to be nice to travel all around the area. This is in the Tewton Mendip area in uh, North Somerset. And so it was originally uh, an ex oh, it was an RAF vehicle. He was demobbed in 1963. Um, and uh, when he bought it, he turned it into a station wagon. It was a hard top before, but he wanted more visibility, seats in the back, uh, and something looking a bit nicer to go around the parish. He basically restored it in the mid-70s, and it was so useful to him, he then completely restored it in the mid-90s. And he did quite a lot of work to it. And at that stage, back in the mid-90s, the traffic was getting faster everywhere, as you already realise. So um, he thought, now, I'd like to give it lots of lo longevity. And he happened to have uh, an XWD Series 2 Land Rover, which had nice axles, um, all sorts of things, like a, a nice new steering box, which is better than the very early Series 1 boxes. It also had a nice um, a gearbox and a few other niceties. So he changed the original Series 1 axles to Series 2 axles, along with other things. And whilst at it, put in an XWD had the Series 3 engine, which hadn't done many miles. And he wasn't quite satisfied with that, so he had the engine completely rebuilt by ACR of Chester. It's got a 9 to 1 compression uh, head. It's got a... Um, a manifold which is gas flowed, a four branch system exhaust manifold and a giant one and three quarter SU carburetor. And it goes very well. I, I can tell it's certainly going to go a lot better. Did you see what I was in this morning? Oh, yeah, that little tiny thing, yeah. Yeah, that little tiny yeah, that thing. That didn't go very fast, did it? No, though? not at all. But to make, it, to, to make sure that it uh, would break easy um, on the road, um, he's fitted disc brakes the front. And there are very few Series 1 or Series 2 or Series 3 Land Rovers with disc brakes. But the disc brakes was a conversion made by um, uh, Mercedes-Benz for Santana Series 3 Land Rovers which are being manufactured in Spain under license. Mm -hmm. And that kit fitted these axles. So it's, it, it's disc braked axles with a servo, brakes over under the, under the bonnet, it's a lovely vehicle, and I have to say that backwards and forwards on the main road, I can cruise at 60 to 65, and sometimes without realising I'm doing 70. Fantastic. You don't see many Series 1s doing that without breaking the sweat, do you? Good on you, sir. I like this vehicle a lot. So this is sort of like the Series 1 GTI, almost. GTI, and, and it it's incog incognito, isn't it? It, it is. It's looks very like incognito. An absolutely I, standard I like that a lot. One. Hello there, sir. Tell me what you brought in here. Uh, this is uh, 1955 86 inch. Uh, in contrast to David's, this is completely standard specification, uh, but it still manages to get me around. Uh, I've owned it for 43 years. I've travelled um, all around this country and many overseas trips as well. Uh, might be a bit slower than David's uh, GT version, but it still gets me there in the end. Very good. And I imagine wherever it is, it will get you there. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Tell me, you bought this 40 odd, 43 years ago. Yeah. I mean, a long time has passed. 43 years is quite a long period of time to own a vehicle. Yeah. What is it about this vehicle that's kept it in your garage for that long? Um, well, it, it, it's really uh, the, it's what the vehicle leads to. It leads to joining the club, making friends in this country and overseas, and it just, uh, just becomes a way of life. Excellent, I like it. I like this a lot. I, I do love originals. Now, <clears throat> I dare say you're missing a few bits on this one. One or two, yes. <laughs> Talk me through what we've got here. It's a 1952 uh, Series 1 80-inch, which I acquired about three years ago uh, as my retirement project to restore. Um, Hoping to get it completed now by the end of this year. After what, what you've done, done so far, I mean, looking at this, this looks like it's just come out of the showroom, doesn't it? Beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely stunning. Now, once you've completed the restoration on it, what's the plan? Just show it, drive it, polish it. Enjoy it. <laughs> Enjoy it. Are you going to use it for its intended purpose? Or are you going to get it muddy? 
No. No. <laughs> to be, I don't blame you, to be honest. I'll try not to. Um, but that's that is my retirement project. So, it, it's um, absolutely stunning. I have to say, like stood next to this. I know from over there you probably can't see this, but stood next to this, it looks it's worthy to head into that museum. It's, it's a fantastic yeah. example. You keep up the good work, sir. Now then, come on then, Kyle. Come on, let's talk about Dodo. Now this vehicle, you will recognise. You will recognise this because it's been in the adverts for the show now for two years, with me hanging off the back of it. And the rest, it's a few. I think it's three or four years now, but um, I'm sure there's enough been said about Dodo already. Now, we've done videos on Dodo, we've talked about Dodo, we've driven Dodo. You've had this car a very, very long time. Yes, I mean, I've, I've grown up with the vehicle, but it, before that was my father's, um, took hold of it in the mid-60s with the Scouts from Leicester. And uh, he, he ran it for a few years with the Scout group, and then when they eventually split up, just took it on, squared the books, and uh, has had it ever since. Um, so he's... In his time, he's been a been a long way around the world, um, mostly Northern Hemisphere, I think. But uh, yeah, done a fair few travels and had uh, now second or two and a half restorations in in those 50 odd years of ownership. Two and a half restorations. I mean, yeah. as as you look, no idea what the half was. I don't. Well, it's maybe it's the front paint. or the back. Oh, paint. Yeah, paint. Was it was it at the front, the back, the left, or the right? That's what I want to know. Where was the paint? Um, but as you look it, it across, was probably repainting where you were hanging on and scratched it. Off. Probably yes. Uh, as you look across the series, one, obviously all of these vehicles do look the same because of course they are all the same vehicles. But when you look close at them, you can see all the slight differences. You've got the GTI version. No, I'm calling it the GTI version now, in, right at the in, very end. In, in disguise. Absolutely. You've got the originality here. You've got the completely brand new restoration here, which I have to it's say, beautiful, isn't it? it's stunning. Shiny. It is. And, Absolutely you know, as he stunning. Said, it's very, very easy to get them dirty. It's very, very hard to get them clean again. Yes. Right then, let's, uh, let's start down here, shall we? You were the first in the arena. Sean, the sheep here with us. Hello, how are you doing? Fine, thank you, Tim. How are you? Very well, thank you. Did you have a good day yesterday? Yeah, we missed you yesterday. May he is perfect. Oh, what is that? How much do you pay him? How much are you paying him? Dave, don't ruin the illusion here. Yeah. That's what we brought in. Uh, we've got a Land Rover Winnick, uh, 1986 Wolf, um, X2 Para. Um, with, with damage to the rack, you know, and we rebuilt it back in early 2000, something. And, and you rebuilt it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. the RTA back in, so the chassis was all damaged. Um, but yeah, we rebuilt it all back to as it was when it was in service, so I've got a picture of it as it was. This is as it was. Fantastic. Fantastic. This, this is what I like to see is when people invest in their vehicles. You know, there's quite a few other shows, shows as well, well, of which, of course, I see you there. And and you're, you're on your best behaviour this weekend. We haven't got a huge arena for you to go storming around, which I know you like to do in this. Uh, but, but it's wonderful that, that people do invest time and energy and the energy and the energy effort to, to get, get it back looking how it would have been in service. It's not the easiest thing to do, is it? No, 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 not no, originally, especially when we did this before uh, with them to quite well send loads of walkers off, so getting the parts at the time was a bit of a, a nightmare, but yeah, it's, it's all come along and, you know, living the dream. Fantastic. That's wonderful to see. Lovely to see that here with us today. What do you think of this, Dave? Lovely, isn't it? It's nice. I mean, yeah, can you imagine going to Tesco's and that? You do, you do. You know like when you get one of those junctions, it's all like you have priority over the other vehicle coming towards you. Do you ever, ever have anyone challenge you? Right. <laughs> Slight left your end. Let, uh, before we move on, the gun on top, what we got? Um, we've got a Browning 50 Cal, um, that's a British Army one as well, dated 1959 originally and in service up to about 2012. There you go, that, that's why you obviously get priority on the road. Uh, wonderful to see that. Hello there, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Now, did you offer to drive this or did he make you drive it? Uh, a bit of both, I guess. A bit of both. <laughs> and then when you saw it coming into the ring, you're like, oh no, there's a man there with a microphone. He's going to come and speak to me. Yeah, yeah sorry, that's going to happen now. Uh, so tell us what you brought in here. Um, so this is a Wimmick, but if you want any more, my dad is just there with the point. Where are you, dad? He's just there. The man over there looking away. Right, come here, dad. You're not getting away. <laughs> The dog won't let you get the dog's icon having none of this. So tell us what we've got over there. It's an ex uh, RAF uh, Wolf GS. 
Uh, it was, it, well, I picked it up off my mate who got it from Brightwells, I think, or Wittens. Um, I rebuilt it as a Wimmick. Um, it's ex Afghanistan, I believe, 34 Squadron. And have you seen any images of it when it was in service? No, we haven't managed to find any yet. Um, it didn't serve as a Wimmick. We built that in 2019, 2018. Fair enough. Well, have a word with this man here. Might be able to point in the right direction. Thank you very much for that, Dave. Your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's nice again. <laughs> yeah, it's nice again. Now this man got out and he's trying to run away. Come on, come on, don't run away. Don't run away. Come on, come, on. come. On. Where Alan's the expert? Is it? Is this yours? No. no. Is it? Is it yours? Yes. Yes. Right. So talk to me. What you fought in? Uh, this is a Wolf Commander, which took out from the TCP, which is a command post with a bed map table in the back. So you managed to get into the arena before him. So I'm going to talk to you about it. Uh, about its replacement. How long you had this for? About two years. Two years. Did you always want one, or was it just sort of you saw it and it was something that came up for sale at Brightwells. There's a theme going on here, isn't there? Just, oh, something's come up for sale, bro. Oh, I'll have a punt on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good job I've never been down there because I'm already in trouble for having too many vehicles at home. Um, why did you choose this? Because it was cheap. <laughs> it's a good answer. It's a good answer. Is it the same for you? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> mine's pre Brightwells. This was Birmingham car auctions. <laughs> In the old days, the army used to get out uh, the vehicles through the local um, auction area um, places in their in their area. This one went out through the Birmingham car auctions. This is a tactical command post. One of only four on the show scenes. Um, there are one or two others uh, about, but there was only. Uh, but there was well, uh, there's only five right-hand drive ones made. There was only about 70 odd made altogether, um, which was out on BOR. The idea is that um, it was used by high-ranking officers or personnel. Uh, that's why it's called a tactical command post because it's tactical. It's not supposed to look anything different. In fact, I met a sergeant that worked on this and, I, and he told me the people that have been in it, I said, oh God, I'm going to have to bully it up. And she said, no, no, it's got to blend in. It's got to look like a normal Land Rover. So when the Prime Minister's in it or Brigadier so-and-so's in it, they, they it don't thing out. So why did you put the roof rack on the top to make it look different? Um, and that's sort of one of the things. Um, it's Pictures of this in service is very rare um, because it would have a security around it. First of all, it would have military police, then it would have an infantry unit around it, and then about three miles out there'd be an armoured uh, recce regiment around it. And depending on the rank of the officer or person in it, it would possibly have two jump jet harriers also looking after it. The vehicle would be in a group of other vehicles. Uh, the radio in here. Um, is set to go to the standard telephone network um, so he could talk to anybody he wanted to um, from the President of America or you if you had information that he wanted um, and so the vehicle will be in a, in a group of its bottle washers and people looking after the people in it hidden up well camouflaged and there will be another two set up similar in a distance away, either so in the woods over that way, or uh, in a uh, so there'd be three. So if anything happened to this, the asset in this vehicle would be taken quickly to one of the other locations that have been listening in, and that would uh, then um, take command. Or if this was completely wiped out, the um, other um, setups they would have been listening in knowing what's going on so the commander in there then would take over um, so these were that's the idea of these just to make sure everything was working and well that, that is the old saying isn't it two is one one is none and three is better yes, yes. so you know they're wonderful to see and you are quite right though you wouldn't see many pictures of them because if you can shoot a photograph you can shoot something else at it well strangely i passed one on the motorway on the way here 
towing a Harrier, Harrier on a trailer. Really? So the front nose of a Harrier. And you know, how often do you see a Harrier looking at you on the motorway? Not the very often. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. By chance, you you weren't. Um, there was a, another 109 in front of it with a trailer with a motorbike on You weren't you weren't towing something on the way here this morning, were you? There's no, no, I, I, this toast. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm... So where should where should we start? Where should we start? I think we should start with the earliest one in the arena. To be Which much isn't much. this uh, yeah. mustard here? I think it's Mr. Mustard. Yeah. I mean, it's wonderful to see not only one three door, but we've actually got two. Uh, three free three doors here with us, and of course, Range Rover started as a three door. It did indeed, and that was because they thought the body shell wouldn't be strong enough with four doors. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when it first it didn't it take them about ten odd years or something like that to catch up it, and get the yeah. the extra doors on the back. It took them until 1981 to get the uh, four door into production. Although there was, of course, the Monte Verdi, which was a conversion, and one or two other four door conversions. Right. Well, let's have a look at our three doors I, I mean just, just look, look at this. this if you would take a black and white photo of that you'd think it was on its press day you, you would. would you would it's lovely actually and it's an early one with the uh, silver bumpers and with the scuttle badges and uh, mirrors on the bonnet and uh, I have spoken to the owner and I know he sweated blood to uh, get this one rebuilt over a number of years and it does him credit well, let's have a word with it. Hello, sir. A big smile on the face now, and quite rightly so. Uh, this does look showroom fresh. Thank you. It should be after so many years of trying to get it looking like this. How many years? 2001 I bought it, and if you can ever say you finish a restoration, I don't think you can, but I finished it in 2015. Wow, wow. So you finished it in 2015. I dare say that if it wasn't finished before COVID, you probably would have managed to get it fitted and finished over that time. Um, very briefly, I don't think we've got enough time for you to do 10 plus years of restoration story, but what have you had to do to this? Um, pretty much everything. I mean, it was pretty rotten when I bought it um, back in 2001, so uh, it's sitting on a new chassis. Everything that we could put back that was salvageable, we did. Um, everything we needed to replace we did so there's probably no stone left unturned really did you ever want to give up i did or well, my wife did but i wanted to carry on yeah, very finished good. and why did you want to do a range rover why this one uh history really my uncle had series one series two so the association with land rover goes back a very long time so uh, and i got you know to drive a range rover when i was 18 fell in love with it Fantastic. And does this bring back those memories? Certainly does. Still feel 18? Yes, indeed. You don't look it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> looking inside. That was rude, wasn't it? I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that. Looking inside that, you can actually see pretty much as it would have come out of the factory. You've got your sort of, the central tunnel is carpeted, but the rest of it is sort of that vinyl-y plastic kind of covering. As you Absolutely. say, for you to hose it out. Yeah, it, it, it's wonderful, Tim. It even smells right, I think. It does, it does. I mean, like, look at the contrast between this. I know this isn't the latest Range Rover, but it's still what it eventually grew into. You look at the difference between those two vehicles, and now when Whenever you say Range Rover to someone, they think luxury. And you look at this, and it wasn't that. Yes, exactly right. It was just a, Ranger, uh, just a Land Rover that went faster and stopped properly. <laughs> Do you know what? We, were you here earlier today? We had uh, our Series 1 in. I missed it, Tim. You missed it, right. There is a grey Series 1 over there. Go and have a look at it because it's the GTIs of Series 1s. It's faster, it stops better, it's a glorious thing. Wonderful. Hello there, sir. How are you? Very well, are you? I'm fantastic, thank you. Now, this one, I have to say, looking far more luxurious than your counterpart next to us here. Uh, how long have you had this? So I've had this about 25 years. And in that time, I had to do restoration uh, work? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, complete, yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a running theme here, James. There, there is, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. None of these Range Rovers is really original. <laughs> no, no, a bit like Trigger's Broom, are they? Um, so this one, obviously, far more luxurious. Still a three-door. What year is this? This is a 1981. 1981. Now, if I was right, isn't that when five doors started coming in? 
Yeah, the, the four law was introduced slightly later in the year. This was February 81, and it was done in conjunction with Wood and Pickett, who were the customizing specialists, um, to see whether the market would accept extra luxury features on a Range Rover. It was a testing the water exercise. So you're quite lucky to have this one then, sir. Uh, yeah, I looked. I actually looked for one of these. I knew what it was. I'd read your book. And um, I... Uh, Eventually, I gave up, though. They were, even then, few and far between. But uh, I found one near, only five miles away from home that somebody had advertised, and I went to see it. I thought it was a two-door Range Rover, so I couldn't believe my luck then. <laughs> Brush with destiny. Yes, yes. There we are. So you are stood, literally, a few feet away from the man who cost you thousands of pounds and thousands of hours yeah, of your I'm just life. Going now, <laughs> I just want to reiterate how long and how much money this man cost you, not only in buying his book, <laughs> but no, wonderful. How does that make you feel, seeing somebody who read your book and then went out to go and find exactly that you inspired him? Well, absolutely delighted. I mean, I wrote it because it was fun for me to find out what was all the different specs and so on. And the the fact that people have picked up on this over the years and started getting them back to the way they were is actually quite exciting. I feel I've done something. They're very good, very good. Now then, this one, an interesting one, because not only a three-door, but obviously uh, sporting a certain livery. Hello there, how are you? Yeah, we're doing fine, thank you. Very good. Tell us what we've got here. It's 1981, 3.5 litre V8. Uh, one of eight delivered to Greater Manchester Police in 1981. It's, uh, they were all destined for motorway service, but this one was acquired by the communications unit and spent uh, 10 years towing a 50-foot antenna around and uh, putting up a communication uh, unit wherever it was required, whichever event that uh, was being policed at the time. Fantastic. They really did get into all sorts of trouble, these, didn't they? They did. And actually, having uh, so many Range Rovers on motorway patrol duties was a huge advert for the company and for the vehicle itself. Well, it, it's very true, actually, because when you think of Land Rover, Range Rover, you don't necessarily think about on-road performance, do you? Exactly. Exactly. So but the, there was something reassuring about having a Range Rover come up behind you with its blue lights flashing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the fact it's got Range Rover written on the front of it and think that was the bit. That, it's probably going to stop before yeah. I try. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move down a little bit further, shall we? We will come back to one of the latest versions in a moment, but yeah, I want to carry on the story through history. Now, I do believe down here, of course, we have got. I mean, considering this is remarkably similar looks to that, but it still looks very different. They managed to update it over time. They did, and I, I have always been full of admiration for the guys who took what was basically a posh Land Rover and turned it into a luxury car without altering the basic um, elements of it. But as you say, this is so different in so many ways. This is a proper luxury car. And so the original Range Rover, remind us of the year that that came into production. That came out in June 1970. June 1970. Now, hello there, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Are you enjoying the show so far? Indeed, I am. Vehicle you're sat in here, what year is it? This is in 1995. 1995. So 25 years later. Still in production. That's the badge on the side. 25th anniversary model. Fantastic looking vehicle. It's very special indeed. How long have you had it? Uh, about two years now. About two years. And were you looking for this specific model or did you just come across it and thought that's the one for me? It was one that came along. I've had 33 Range Rovers since 1985. Th 30? You haven't read his book by chance, have you? I've got his book at home. Well, don't read it, whatever you do. <laughs> Don't read really, because you'll end up with 40 odd. Now, wonderful to see that. Now, when did uh, the first Range Rover head out of production? It came out of production in February 1996, and I was lucky enough to be at the last the ceremony for the last one to come off the line. 
Um, that was fun. That was one of these. It was actually built slightly before the time it came off the line because it had to go through special uh, special vehicles to be given its special features. But anyway, they put it on the end of the line and that became the last one. Fantastic. Now, from there, obviously, Range Rover then moved forward. And uh, now we're in the period of, is this when we have BMW at the Range? This indeed is, although the Range Rover, the second generation Range Rover, was developed before BMW bought the company. A lot of people think that the diesel engine was put in because BMW had bought Range Rover, which wasn't the case. The deal had been done with BMW before the uh, company deal was done. And this, of course, P38? Well, you can call it the P38. Uh, they originally called it the Project 38A. Um, P38 is a name that's been used by the trade and has become accepted, but it isn't actually the real one. Fair enough. Now then, you're sat here uh, next to what, a very, very special vehicle, but you can see how this uh, has matured over time. And you can still see some of the very similar elements going between these vehicles as the, uh, the design has evolved over time. Uh, how long have you had this for? Um, I've had this for about 10 years. This is the 30th anniversary, so August 2000 um, production. And am I right in saying that uh, this uh, model actually had quite a short lifespan, is that right? It did, yes. Um, it was supposed to be upgraded in 1999 with BMW engines, but then BMW realised they'd be better off spending the money on a completely new Range Rover. So they cut the production life of this one short and got the third generation vehicle into production quickly. So third generation, if I remember rightly, and I could be wrong here, but that came in, what, about 2001, somewhere around there? Late 2001. It was announced 2002 availability. So we're talking this coming in in what 96 and then going out in 2000. So that's only about six odd years. Yeah, that's right. Considering that here you're sat in yours with your 25th anniversary. It's a, quite a remarkable change. It was a remarkable change. And although there are fewer 38As about than the others, it's just worth knowing that the 38A was so popular at its, in its time that it was selling twice as fast as the original Range Rover in wow. just those six years. And looking at the design elements between them, you can still see elements in the design, say, for example, on the bonnet, even around the headlights, you know, the way they've wrapped the indicators and side lights around here and built them into a, almost a whole unit going across there. The, the, the maturity of the design was there. That's absolutely right, Tim. The main thing is they had to deal with a very conservative customer base who didn't really want change, but they did want modern features. So they had to, a very difficult job to combine the two into a, a vehicle that looked like the old one, as much as possible, but was actually better in a number of ways. Well, there you are. You've just heard it. Apparently the owners are quite conservative but want modern features. Is that what you'd describe yourself? Uh, I've been described as many things, but I'm not sure about that. Well, there you go. That is a, do I dare say that's better than what you've been described as? No, I'm joking. Tell us more about yours. 2001, uh, so fairly late. 4 litre V8, and so not the high spec, but middle of the road. Um, fairly unusual colour, Monte Carlo blue. And you chose this why? The colour, really. The colour stood out. It is a glorious colour. It you have is. To say. Do you know what? Our Range Rover is green because my wife likes green. Right. But obviously a big influence on vehicle choice. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, of course, we've got... Well, it wasn't quite this one, but again, this was sort of the upgrade of the vehicle that replaced it. And we're stood here between the Range Rover Sport. Am I right in saying this is the first time Range Rover had a Sport model? That is almost correct, Tim. There was actually, oddly enough, a very brief limited edition in the USA called the Range Rover sport and I think it didn't have much on it apart from special wheels but uh, this was the first separate model of a Range Rover Sport. And between the two of them, although you've got Range Rover and Range Rover Sport and they're modelled and positioned pretty much side by side, if memory serves me right, these two are actually quite different in their build. They are indeed. The Range Rover, the full fat, full size Range Rover, is a monocoque with subframes, whereas the Range Rover Sport is actually built on a shortened version of the Discovery 3 underframe or chassis in the traditional body on frame style. And, but wasn't it a, a, a lot of monocoque body that was then planted on top of the on top of the chassis? Yes it was. It's simply that there uh, the monocoque body didn't have to be quite as strong as if it was 
the pure monocoque because it had the chassis to add additional strength. Right, I'm going to come on to you, sir. Now, <coughs> Lil Birdie tells me that. Uh, well, the uh, constable a few uh, doors down might want to have a word, because this isn't yours. No, I stole it about ten minutes ago. <laughs> a good, honest thief, I like that. Why'd you steal this and not the one next to you? Uh, the owner said he wasn't dressed properly to go in the arena. And he thought you were? It's that, it's, it's that <laughs> chap there, in the, uh, next to Chris Elliott. <laughs> and he stood there filming his car, and everyone, it's him, it's him here. <laughs> You're not dressed properly to drive this. I've never, I've never in my life been in an arena and had someone say, sorry, I'm not dressed appropriately to drive my vehicle. Uh, how are you finding this? You enjoying it? It's, it's, it's a very nice vehicle. It's uh, a Westminster, which was a, a special edition for this model of Range Rover. Fantastic. It, it does look absolutely glorious. This. It does. And I can understand why there is this issue of whether you're dressed properly. I mean, a chap does have to dress properly to drive a Range Rover, you know. Well, I take this waistcoat wasn't cheap. I put this on specially just for the show. I'm glad I did, but I sort of wish I hadn't because I am sweltering out here. Hello there, how are you? All right, thank you, yeah. Yours this time? Yeah. Good, excellent. No, no more theft going on here. Uh, if you actually look between these two vehicles inside, you can see quite a few differences. From the outside, they do look remarkably similar, but inside you can see quite a few differences. How come you chose a Sport over a full range? I've had Range Rovers in the past, Series 1 and 2, uh, then I went to BMW um, for a bit of speed and then I wanted to go back to Range Rover so I got the Sport and 4.2 supercharged. Have you got the key? Yeah. Start it up. Let's have Stand a listen. By. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she purrs. Oh, she purrs. Let's really like me. I do like that. Now, hang on. Go on then. Lovely stuff. Now, I'm, I'm very pleased that you did that. Uh, I can see that the petrol needle's gone down already, and considering the price of petrol, uh, it's worth every penny, right? Exactly, yeah. I uh, actually, for the first four and a half years, kept all my receipts for petrol, worked it all out, it cost me seven grand to keep it on the road, just petrol. When did you get it? Uh, 2011. So petrol would have been what, about 120 a litre around then? I don't know, but I worked out, it still only worked out about £30 a week because obviously I only used it for the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only using it at the weekends, <laughs> it's cost me 30 I bet what it's costing you now, about you walk to work. See, that, <laughs> that says it all, that's dedication. I brought a supercharged V8 Range Rover to walk to work, absolutely excellent. Brilliant. Right then, let's move on to one of the very latest iterations. Of course, we haven't got the absolute latest iteration of the Range yep. Rover here with us yet, but we have got nearer enough than expecting. And this is just the pinnacle, isn't it, really? It's gone from being hosed out, uh, you know, wash out interiors to, well, you wouldn't want to get the interior wet in this at all, would you? Uh, no, not with the amount of electrics in this thing, costs an absolute fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and, but isn't it worth it? Uh, well, of course it is. It's a nice, it's a Range Rover. You know, does that really answer the question? It does. It, it really is almost the king of vehicles. Yes, it is. I mean, you see one of these on the motorway and you kind of automatically move over because you know it comes seemingly past at 10 miles an hour over the minute. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 10 miles an hour, that's a bit conservative. Oh, well, I'm being nice to you. <laughs> uh, but what are your thoughts on, well, what was the very latest and uh, now obviously has uh, been moved forward even more? Yeah, I, I, uh, I find it an interesting evolution of the original. I think for most of the buyers, the off-road underpinnings are now irrelevant. I actually think they're very important. I think it's part of the DNA of the vehicle, but uh, they've moved on a long way from 1970. It is now very much a big luxury car with off-road ability thrown in rather than the other way around. Yes, absolutely. But still, when you look at the elements on this, you can still see some of those design elements creeping through. You can. Those are the styling cues that the stylist, styling department uh, have to keep in the vehicle to make it recognisable for what it is. Do you think customers are as conservative these days? Because we're, we're far more open to wealth now. 
I think customers are much less conservative now, and I think that's largely to do with the introduction of the Range Rover Sport, because it broadened the idea of what a Range Rover could be. It's no longer just for uh, someone wealthy, it is someone who wants something well built, distinctive, and these days quick as well. Absolutely, because let's be honest, whether it's one of the very early Range Rover, I mean, he's done an outstanding, outstanding restoration on this vehicle. Will we ever take it off road? No, no. And there is my point. The vast majority of these vehicles spend most of their lives on the road. That's quite right, yes. And th therefore, moving away from a off-road vehicle with luxury capabilities to the other way around, a luxury vehicle with uh, with the off-road capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. And quite frankly, I don't think the market is there for uh, a vehicle with such great off-road capability. I'm pleased that it's still got it, but very, very few customers buy it for that reason. Yes, yes indeed. Well, a couple of years ago we celebrated a big birthday for Range Rover. Yeah. Uh, what do you reckon we're going to be doing or seeing from them? In, because in, over the next 10, 20 years, the automotive industry is going to change massively. Where do you reckon Range Range Rover's going to sit there? Well, I think Range Rover, if they retain the brand, and I'm sure they will, has got to sit right at the top of the off-road, well, no, off-road is a secondary consideration. It's got to sit right at the top of the luxury market and retain the off-road capability, even if only a tiny proportion of the buyers use it. Absolutely. It's that point of when they do use it, it's still got to be king of the hill. It still will be the only thing that can do it, I'm sure. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, the Range Rover Register, please can you put your hands together for this fantastic display. So he wins, yeah, okay, he's got a siren, all of you, pack it in. <laughs> or was, he'll come down and take down your details. Now, wonderful to see, great to hear the engine starting up. Uh, if you want to see more of these, if you want to get up close, they are literally just behind us, Range Rover Register, right by the entrance to the museum. Have you headed inside the museum yet today, James? Absolutely. And while they're going out, I think we will just listen to the lovely burble of all those V8 engines. Absolutely. Coming up next for you, ladies and gentlemen, we move from the King of the Road down to our Mini Me's. They will be joining us in the main arena as soon as it is safe for us to do so. Range Rover Register, thank you very much. As Tim predicted, it has on the uh, grill just above the number plate in very small letters, prototype vehicle. So we'll let this, uh, and see if he wants to do a couple of parade laps around for us so we can have a look. I'll just... <laughs> yeah, on two wheels all the way around. Um, what I do find interesting, you can see the four wheel steer there working well. Yeah, that's interesting. And of course, one of the things about this is that it has that feature on the side which is deliberately intended to recall a similar feature on the last one, on the 405. And it's pure styling, that one. But of course, the other thing about the latest Range Rover is that it's using the very much reductionist or minimalist styling that is now the way Land Rovers are going. Started with the Velar and uh, is clearly the way they're going to go in the short term. Well, there we are, ladies and gents, the very latest Range Rover. We weren't expecting to see this in the arena here with us. Now that before you run away, <coughs> firstly, are you, meant, are you meant to have this here? Uh, officially, unofficially, yeah. <laughs> officially, unofficially. I'm assuming that you are in some way connected to the brand or work for the brand? Yes, yeah. Okay, we won't tell everybody your name and uh, we'll make sure your employers see the show video as soon as and then they can be like, why is that vehicle in the main arena? Um, so, how much do you know about this? Uh, a fair bit. A fair, a fair bit. bit. Right, share with us some little uh, pieces of knowledge. Uh, obviously, we've already said the four-wheel steer, um, just the technology compared to 405 is just, yeah, on another level. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And what's your involvement with the vehicle? Uh, so, I'm, I'm from a quality point of view. It's obviously a big job to do, so, yeah, and we're, uh, I think we're uh, miles ahead of where we have been. Good, right, C come, come, come with me, sir. Come with me. Land Rovers are known for being able to go anywhere. Range Rovers are known for being very luxurious vehicles. Anybody here 
Have you ever had a problem with a Land Rover or Range Rover? Put your hands up for me if you've ever had an issue with your Land Rover or Range Rover. Quite a few hands there. If you'd like to form an orderly queue, this man will very... <laughs> <laughs> so, are we allowed to have a look inside? Yeah, right, let's have a look, shall we? Wow, I mean, you think the outside is minimalist. If it's an inside this, it is so clean. There's it hardly is. anything in there. Yes, you wouldn't think there are very many controls at all, would you? Until you switch that screen on. <laughs> then you can spend all day scrolling through the options. What I find really interesting with this is you can see the elements of the previous generation Range Rover, but when I look in there, I'm actually drawn more to the very original Range Rover from the 1970s. Yeah, That's what I see in there. That. Yeah. That's what I see in there. The, the very simple steering wheel, almost a, a two-spoke steering wheel, very essence of that original 1970s. Have you tried hosing it out? Uh, no, no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you wouldn't try uh, hosing that out at all. Absolutely beautiful thing, this. Absolutely stunning. Um, do I dare ask where this starts at a price? I think we're I think about 95,000 starting. And this one, is it standard? No, this is uh, HSC, um, so it's one up, uh, and this is 110. 110,000 pounds. I could buy two of those for the price of my house. <laughs> There you go. Well, you can't drive your house, but you can live in a Range Rover. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you could you could have one for Saturday and one for Sunday. Where's the gentleman who bought a Range Rover Sport for the weekend? There we are. He could have two, couldn't he? Yeah. One for no Saturday, one for Sunday. Sir, thank you so much for bringing this down. It's an absolute pleasure to see you. Please don't leave me hanging. Let's have a shake of the hand. That's fantastic. Um, wonderful to see this, ladies and gents. Please put your hands together. What a treat that is. Ryan, hello there. Yeah, What's right. your name? Tom. Tom, I'm Tim. Tim, Tom, can't Tim's go wrong here, can it? Two T's. So we are in brand new Defender. We are in brand new Defender. And we are going on, what's this contraption called over here? So that is called, essentially, well, essentially it's the ramp that takes us up to roughly around about a 40 degree ascent, which is amazing really. It's unnatural for a road condition, let's just say. Right, um, so Tom is going to take us on the Land Rover experience on a 40 degree ramp in the new, what's the price tag on this? I mean, they start around 45, but you can, you can get up to roughly around about 130,000 pounds. Right, let's um, see what happens then. You can come with a V8 if you wanted to as well, which is another good thing. So we're in low ratio. We've also got the uh, air suspension up to the off-road height. And just to put it into perspective as well, I've put the car into comfort program. Okay. So this is how capable the car is going to be now. So the good thing about this is I've got... Now I'm looking at that from this perspective, yep. and that looks flat to me. That looks like you're just going up against a vertical wall. Well, we'll find out, shall we? Okay. So, all I've got to do now, wheel's nice and straight. And then introduce the car up. Introduce the car up? We're looking at the Scott. <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculous. This is... <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's quite fun, though. <laughs> there we go. So this is going to take us up to about two storeys high. And, right. Uh, if I was kids in the back now, I'd usually say that it's around same height as a giraffe's head. You're having a giraffe, aren't you? Definitely having a giraffe. Right, how much further up is this going? A little bit further, yeah. We've been a little bit, I'm gonna fall out of this. <laughs> Can you... As long as you've got your belt on, you're okay. <laughs> got a belt on? It's the line of my suspenders on as well. No, that's silly now. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so what I've got to do now, to get to yeah. that point, I'm waiting for the lights to go up. Essentially, I've got to release the brake and let the same control take me down. All I've got to do is steer. Put your foot back on the brake now. This is ridiculous. Tom! <laughs> no! <laughs> that is ridiculous. There From the outside, that doesn't look as scary. But when you're sat inside of it, that is yeah. ridiculous. No. Hello there, sir. How are you? Yeah, all right, thanks. Yeah, good, good. Good, good, good. Tell us what you brought in here. Uh, 1961 Series 2A on a two and a quarter engine. On a two and a quarter engine. How long you had this for? Uh, 10 years now. 10 years, it's obviously doing something right if you've had it for 10 odd years. What have you done to it in that time? Kept my wife happy, not spent a lot of money on it and uh, taken her out for a few drinks and um, food. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of an oxymoron there, keeping wife happy, not spent too much money, but taken the wife out for drinks and food. Everyone else has spent lots of money, lots more money, and still more money to spend. This man said he's not spent much. No, this man you should never play poker with, because he has got the best poker face going. That is lovely. Uh, right colour for a Land Rover as well, isn't it? 
I love the new galved toe in eyes. They're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lovely. Hello there, sir. How are you? Very well, thank you, yourself. I'm very well. Very warm. Very warm. The, the sun shines out, and I even said to the uh, to the organizer, what do, you want, what do you want me to wear? Do you want me in uh, something nice? Do you want like you know waistcoats and so forth? Got a lovely union jacket. Oh, would that have been lovely? Yes. Absolutely baking. I'm wearing three layers, and I'm sweltering. Uh, but it feels a bit cooler in there. Uh, not too bad at all. The air conditioning on, as you can see. <laughs> You've got the air conditioning open, as it is. Africa safari <laughs> roof. Absolutely. That this is the Africa heat. I believe it's a tropical roof, not a safari roof. Tropical roof, probably, yes. Yeah, see, yeah, tropical the safari roof had the bench in. Uh, this is just a sunshine roof. You live and learn. See, this is, this is the yeah, thing. Right, right. This is the thing with Land Rover. Yeah. So I do all makes and marks. I do, you know, everything from Aston Martin, Ferrari, to Land Rover. So to you name it, I do a Land Rover. Show us there is always, always you say, Oh, I think it's this. Ah, da, 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 da. A second opinion is always there. Hello there, sir. How are you? Very good. Excellent. Now, this looks more of a commercial. Obviously, we've got some sign writing on the back. Is this your own, own sign writing, own business? Uh, no, it's not. This was my uh, grandfather's business um, back in 1987. They sold it. And only last week, this is the first time that that logo has been on a vehicle in 35 years. Now, then, young man, what's your name? Aidan. Ada, and how old are you? Five. Five. Now, did you see the mini me's earlier? No. No. That's probably for the best. Well, I say probably best for you, Dad, isn't it? Because he'd be like, I want one of those. Do you know that they do little mini Land Rovers that you can drive? Yeah. <laughs> he does uh, now. <laughs> he does now. Sorry. He, if, if you want to get away with it, just talk to the man over there because apparently he's not spent much money on this Land Rover, so he'll get you out of trouble. Right then, let's move on to you. A Dormobile, pop top roof, and it's up as well. Yep, it's a genuine Martin Walter Dormobile factory conversion, September 1971. Restored in 2016-17 from the ground up. Fantastic. And I have to say, these pop-top roofs are not easy to work on. I've got a pop-top roof camper van myself, and it's an absolute nightmare being fiberglass, trying to get it back into the right shape and repair it all. A nightmare. So to see this from a ground-up restoration is wonderful. Well, believe it or believe it not, I've actually done nothing to the roof other than clean it and put a few patches on it. And that's the last time I'm talking to you this weekend. <laughs> 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 How annoying. I've, I'm spending months and months and months working on my roof, and he's here with a roof better than mine. Engine transplant, though, 200 TDI. Yeah, defender. Yeah. <laughs> You're a defender. There's a series two with the defender yeah, heart. Engine a bit more, that's all. Uh, we saw a series one, the series one GTI. Exactly, the GTI, yeah. Which I've aptly named the GTI, the grey series one that is sat behind us, which can keep up even with modern traffic. Not many series ones can say that. Have you been out with modern traffic? It does 10 mile an hour, most traffic. Now. Yes, yes. I drove all the way from Alton Park here this morning, and even at 5.30 a.m., they had still got a speed restriction on the M6. Ridiculous. Anyway, hello, sir. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Are you? I'm very well, thank you. What year have we brought in here? A 1960 short wheelbase, genuine station wagon. Genuine station wagon. So we've got four facing each other in the back and yeah. three in the front. That's it, correct. I mean, that's not bad, is it? I mean, seven seater for something that's. Vents in the roof, in the roof, roof yes. In the roof. We know this is then. Not, Not a tropical, tropical roof, it's a safari Well, he can, he can decide. It's a tropical or safari? It's a tropical. It's there you are. It's you genuine as it come out the factory. It's genuine as it come out the factory. There you are, Dave. You've been corrected twice now. You've learned, haven't you? The tropical roof up there. But I'm really impressed with this. The seven seats, and it's not a long vehicle at all, is it? No, it's been completely restored. Me and By yourself? No, me and my son have been doing it for the last four years. Last four um, years? Yeah, it was a field find had been abandoned since 1980 in a field, and we picked it up four years ago. New chassis, new suspension, new wiring, completely rebuilt it. Me and my son. Wow, that is fantastic. I think you have to ask the good lady in the back how she likes travelling sideways. <laughs> for long distance. Hello. Hello. How do you like travelling sideways for long distance? Well, I don't. <laughs> How about you? Very bumpy. Yeah. Very bumpy. Right, hang on one second. One second. Very bumpy. Hello there, young man. How old are you? I'm uh, 40. 40. Now, when your dad came back with this, 
whose idea was it? Oh, yours. It was all his, yeah? Uh, did you have a choice in the matter? No, I work at Solly Hall Land Rover, so it's uh, for a living, so he's got taking work home with me. <laughs> so when the phone call came, being like, hey, I've, I've bought a project. I hung up on him. <laughs> <laughs> but he still roped you into doing it? Yeah. Yeah, all done in the garage, uh, um, so every panel's been taken off, re-sprayed, uh, flat, flatted back down to bare metal and re-sprayed, all by me uh, in the garage. Well, it's an outstanding job. I love the sneakiness of the little film going on there. You didn't think I'd catch you, did you? Ha! <laughs> I caught you there. Anyway, I love the fact that you've done all the work on this. It looks absolutely glorious. My hat goes off to you, but my hat actually goes off to you, sir, for making your son do all the work, and then you've got the car that's worth some money. Well done. Right then, let's move on to you, sir, in a minute. I want to come to you next, sir. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Tell me more about this. This is Minty, a 1967 ex-military Rover 9. It was rescued from a scrapyard by a previous owner, and I uh, was explaining to my wife that I wanted to buy a Land Rover with a bed, and two minutes later, I just happened to come across one at a show and pretty much bought it on the spot, which you're not supposed to do. And I spent all weekend sleeping in the back of it. Fantastic. So how long have you had this for? I've had it for four and a half years. Oh, well, that was a, that was a good purchase. I mean, that could have gone horribly wrong. Um, and I've got a place to go when I argue with the wife. <laughs> hey, that's a... Come with me. Come with me. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. <coughs> you know when your poker face runs out, yeah? Have a chat with this man because he bought a Land Rover sightseeing for somewhere to sleep. I'll introduce you to the two. He'll teach, he'll teach you how to lie and you can find out where to buy a Land Rover you can fit a bed in. I'll leave you to it. There we are. Right then, let's come back. <laughs> Let's come back down to you, sir. You thought you got away with this, didn't you? But no, I'm back. Hello there, how are you? All right, thank you. Tell me more about this. It's a uh, 1966 Series 2A station wagon. Series 2A station wagon. So how many seats have we got back here? We've got another row and then we've got space more in the back as well. Yep. Uh, originally, it should have been a 12-seater, I believe. A 12-seater? I'm not going to tell you how many seats he's got. He's got more seats than you. <laughs> this was dearer on the road tax than that. That was dearer on the road tax than that. Yeah, but he did all the work fixing you, so don't start talking to me about money. Um, how long have you had this for, you say? Uh, only a couple of years. Only a couple of years. And you bought it like this, or you had to do work on it to get it up to this? I've had to do a lot of work with me. Uh, one of my mates has helped me. And, uh, well, like we're in a very very sorry state when we bought it. There's a bit of a theme running here, isn't there? You two don't know each other, do you? Not yet. Not yet, because <laughs> you bought one out of a field and he bought one that should have been in a field by the sound of it. No, <laughs> wonderful to see this. Well done to you, keep the work on it. And P 200 TDI. Yeah, power steering. with P38 power steering. Look at this, Range Rover chassis seat, classic seats, Range Rover diffs. Did you have a Range Rover or had a Range Rover? This is the deluxe. Uh, we first. come across a very good find of a Range Rover that had done uh, 35,000 miles. And Night heat of the a donor. Heated front screen. That might be the GT. This is the deluxe. Th this is the deluxe. Do you know what? Actually, I'm reading the night. Are you listening? Night heater. You got one of those in your four poster in the back there. Yep. I'm talking to this man over here. You got a night heater. Blankets and shivering. He's got a night eater in this one. Well, I'm not going to say it's the luxury model. I know, I know. I mean, if watch him, watch him, because as soon as he sees something, he ends up buying it. Right, let's move on to our final two, because we've got Freelanders coming in as well, haven't we? On the queue. Excellent. Right, so let's come on to you, sir. Hello. Hello. What have we bought in here? It's a 1965 Series 2A short wheel base station wagon. So we've still got the seats in the back? Oh, you've put some seats in the back, yeah. Very good, very good. There's, there's a lot of variety in the series too, isn't there? The, the seats are an ongoing theme with 200 TDIs in the back. Mm -hmm. All being upgraded. Hmm. Sensible upgrade. So why have we gone for that upgrade? Um, reliability really and just turn the key and it starts. I also tow a caravan with it, a twin axle caravan. I've towed to North Wales and uh, various pl other places. Um, it tows really well, it's loads of power, loads of torque, um, reasonably economical and starts every time. 
But not many Land Rover owners can say that, can they? Starts every time. Right then, let's move on to you. And is this old Rosie? It is, yeah. Is it? It's a two and a quarter. A two and a quarter. Original. A two and a quarter original petrol, which I'm really impressed with. However, what I see is old Rosie, and that just reminds me of a cider in a pub that I should probably be in because it's so sunny outside, right? How good does that sound, just having a lovely cider right now? That's what your car's making me think of. But two and a quarter petrol, 1968. Um, original engine? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, well, it's original to me, but as far as I know, it's the original engine. All the numbers match. Uh, if it's numbers match, then I'd say it's original. And if we're going to get really techy now, oh, Captain, Captain Winch. Wow. Go on, talk yeah, me through. It's a Captain Winch. Dream. Everyone wants a Captain Winch. There you go. There is one. It's a special road, all round. I know, but one of these electrics. that man will end up buying it if you keep pointing it. Well with his <laughs> <laughs> he could sleep in it as well. How long have you had this for? Uh, 2009 I bought it and restored it since then. Fantastic. So you've had it a good old few years now. Yeah. Um, any plans for it? Not really. I mean, restore the engine. It, it does use more oil than petrol. <laughs> so, um, yeah, air, engine and gearbox is next. I, I did it as a rolling restoration, so I fixed what breaks, basically, new chassis and everything. And once that was done, put everything back in because I didn't know what was broken. So drive it until it breaks and then fix it. Perfect. And the best way to keep old cars on the road is to put them on the road. They don't like being laid up and stored because things seize up and end up rotting away. We don't like that. But wonderful to see old Rosie. I've seen her many, many shows before. Hopefully we'll see her many, many more. Let's move on with this, shall we? Uh, you brought in a commercial, a uh, Freelander 1 commercial. That's right, yeah, so I think they started these in, um, I think it was 2000 or just before 99s where you, get the, you can get some L-series and K-series and this is the uh, the later M47 TD4 engine in this one and uh, yeah, they did them right up to the end, I think 06, you might be get some 07 registered ones, but yeah. So quite popular, very roomy in the back. Um, the dip slight difference between this and the normal three-door is how it's got the metal panels and no glass in the rear quarter, mm -hmm. and it's just got like a cagey thing in the back to a cagey thing. A cagey thing, yeah, yeah. There's two types. You can get the cage or the, an actual metal. Um, Solid body uh, between the two. Now you weren't in this last year, were you? No, I was in my turbo. I put a K-series turbo in, in two Freelanders. This is one of five. One of five. So this <laughs> is the thing. As soon as as soon as a maker or model gets under your skin, yeah, yeah. that's it. Oh, you can't yeah. get rid of them, can you? And exactly. Yeah. And you end up talking to more and more people in the owners' club, and then you see one come up, and you're like, I like Do you know what? After, I'm, I'm going to have that because it's a good price, or I don't want it yeah, yeah. to get scrapped, or I don't want something to happen yeah. to it. Well, th this is the thing: is the part of the club it just really really helps you know these are a, a fantastic vehicle well priced and you see them and think that, that's a scrap value I've got to, I've got to rescue it so I've rescued half a dozen now I've just got them for you know I don't, you know make a drink out of it and just put it back in the road and someone else can enjoy it are Freelanders going up in price certainly the early ones yeah there's some really really collectible ones now any like black tops we've got a lovely one uh, later down here and um, the uh, 50th anniversary ones, anything kind of semi-special edition, like early L series, five doors, getting rarer and rarer each year. So very good, very good. Now, have you got any room left on your car to put anything else on there? Yeah, I've got loads. Got <laughs> how, do you, how do you clean it? I don't. It's, it's a good answer, it's a good answer. Have you got more, you've got more stickers on the inside of it as well? My, my nice gear stick, look. <laughs> I'm not I'm even going to tell you. <laughs> I, don't think, I'm not I don't know even exactly what. Tell you <laughs> what is on that gear stick. This yeah. is a family show. A family show. That is rude. No, stop. Stop doing that. Stop now. It's called a gear knob for a reason. Just no. <laughs> You two, Patty, it's been a very long weekend. Do not look inside that car. Do, no, do not look inside that. Do you know, do you know her? Uh, I've just met her at this meet. Uh, but I'm told that I have to change mine now. <laughs> This is a conspiracy, isn't it? You've all conspired to wind me up. It's all for help for heroes, that's why. It's help for heroes. What, yeah. what type of help? 20, 20 quid to put, to put that on. Wow. Wow. 
How much is he going to give? Uh, how much would he have to give you? A hobnob and a cup of tea. Good lord. Don't, Don't you start, start on about hobnobs. Right, hello there, you. Thankfully, your car's far more yeah. appropriate. Um, <laughs> tell us what you brought in here. Uh, this is my Freelander TV4. I own it seven years. Um, it's my daily drive. It's done over 200,000 miles. In seven years, it's never not started and it's never let me down. There you go. There we have an example of a Land Rover that works and it's a Freelander. People really do overlook Freelanders. Hello, how are you? Hello, all right. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very. I'm better now that I'm moving down. I was. I had a bit of a shock, to be quite honest, when I looked inside there. Um, <laughs> how long have you had this? Uh, since December 2015. Daily driver? Yeah. Love it? TD4, love it. Um, never let me down. I had to do a few uh, things to it and put a few mods on it, but it's yeah, it's great, love it. It's called the Goldlander, probably three reasons. Good, I like that. Why do you think people are so against Freelander? I don't know, I think there's a certain amount of snobbery there, I say. Um, it's not a proper land drone, but it was never meant to be a competitor for like the Defender or anything like that. It's just, it's what it is, it's a great car, and people don't realise the, um, the capabilities of them are great. I think part and parcel of that as well is some of the components were kind of taken from the back, you know, a typical Rover from the back, back cupboard and stuff, and so people thought them as cars, but they, they do have an aspect of a complicated drivetrain system, and if you've gone from a car and not kind of realised that, so in, later on in life they've probably not been maintained a bit, and then they kind of get that bad now, oh, this, 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 that, mm -hmm. but you know, with the uh, other, other brands of the Land Rover and stuff, you know what you're getting into, you know you've got to be careful about stuff or look after certain things, and I think some of these people, oh, and you know, you go to a dealership and you get a big bill, and there's things like the clubs here, we, we you know, there's people now starting to specialise in Freelanders, you know, helping hand and how to do, you know, things in a cost-effective way of putting it back on the road. Very good, very good. Right, I'm going to come to you next. Hello, how are you? All right, thank you. Hey, uh, uh, right, forget, forget about the car, okay? I'm just looking over here in the passenger seat. There's a cool box. What's in there? Just buttons. <laughs> no way, I've drank that. <laughs> I'm like, no way, I've, I've drank that. I'm going to come and check in there. Just as soon as we're done, I'm having a look at that. I don't believe it. I reckon there's one sneaking in there. Hello there, how are you? Vaguely uh, hungover and sunburned. Vaguely hungover and sunburned. Well, things could be a lot worse. They could be a lot worse. You could not be hungover and soaking wet. I could have said you were driving the deck then. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you know what? I think next year we get you guys in first. Yeah. We get you guys in first and I'm going to come and talk to you and you can say that on the mic when there's lots of people here and then we can all sit back and watch what happens next. <laughs> Why do people hate on the Freelander? I, I think anybody that's ever driven a Freelander doesn't hate one. I think you need to give it a chance and you won't know that. That's a very good point. There's, there's a lot of owners who have kind of come into it as a stopgap. You know, yep. they, they have a job or something that needs it, something that's more than a road vehicle, and they've kept them. We've had men, oh, I bought it for a week, you know, whatever, and they've kept it for shooting, things like that. Really, really popular. It's well, particularly for so Land 2s. They're so cheap that you can buy it as a throwaway car. It, it, Almost, it's getting uh, some, you know, obviously with COVID times, COVID tax, some stuff's gone up and stuff, but yeah, they're still a very, very capable car for a good price. Very good, very good. How long have you been uh, part of the Freelander Club? Um, just today. Actually. About 20 minutes. Just today. So you turned up in this and now you've joined. Yeah. Now, on your jacket here, it says Defender Launch Eastland 2020. Were you there? Yeah, I'm going to stop the jacket. Did you hear what he just said? You didn't hear? Oh, this is good. Put your window down. <laughs> that window oh, didn't work. The window broke. Good. Was the window broke? <laughs> that is karma, right there. He said he could be having a lot worse day and be driving the Defender. You go and have worse. You crack up. Right, let's come on to you then. Hello there. How are you? How long have you been part of the club? Five years. In a nutshell, what's the club like? Great fun. And fun. Fun, friendly, and have they helped? I mean, have you ever had a problem with your car? Yeah, very normal for people. For these particular, we've had a 
Because when, whenever you buy a used car, you don't really know what you're buying, do you? This is it, and it's just that thing's like, I've, I've heard this noise, I'm hearing this judder, and, I, you know, just from certain kind of characteristics explained, you can kind of at least help guide them down a particular path. You know, we haven't got a code reader or something, but mm -hmm. it kind of says, well, it might be this, this, and this, at least it narrows down where you want. And this is just experience we're building up over the years of, of you know, loving them and driving them. So you know, what I'm trying to get to with here is to move people on from that perception of freelanders you know, not being proper land rovers, as somebody yeah. said. Yeah, they have got that sort of negative perception around them. And one of the ways of getting around that is to come and speak to people like yourselves in the Freeland Rovers Club. This, uh, we, we've actually had really good comments today because um, you know uh, yesterday we had about 40 cars over in, on the bank and uh, lots of very friendly comments and stuff all coming up. And you can see we've got a wide variety of types of Freelanders so they might have only seen a particular type. Oh, I didn't know you could do this or do that. And uh, you know, th there's a lot of kind of uh, green landing videos and stuff. You just go on YouTube or various channels and you'll just see the Freeland and, uh, you know, having a good time uh, with all the others. Guys, thank, thank you, you so much. much. This, this is our final reader activity. A big thank you to the Freeland Rovers Club. Thank uh, you. you rounded us off last year as well. well. Uh, so, so you, you rounded us off again this, this year. year. A big, big, big thank you to these guys. Um, and please do start considering Freeland. Just stop please do. It. And if you want a good place to start, Freelander Owners Club. Freelander Owners Club, absolutely. I'm going to come out and see you guys shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been your commentator, Tim Watson. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Thanks so much for watching this video, guys. I do hope you've enjoyed it. If you have underneath this video, you'll find a thumbs up. Hit that and right next to it, there's a subscribe button. Hit that, you'll get a new video from me every week. Coming up next is a live stream from here at the British Motor Museum. That's going to be live for you at 6.15 on Tuesday night. Make sure you tune in because we're bringing a very special car out to the museum, a prototype Jaguar, no less. Hopefully, I'll see a few of you here. If not, I'll see you on the live stream. Once again, thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you again soon.